Okay, so this is the second part of chapter three. We're going to be talking about the last two classes of biological macromolecules. And those are going to include proteins and nucleic acids. We've already covered carbohydrates and lipids in the last video. So for proteins, um, these are the learning outcomes that we expect you to, to, to learn by the end of um, this section. You should be able to describe what proteins do inside of your cells. Um, or some of the functions that they do. The relationship between amino acids and proteins, the four levels of organization, and how shape um, is related to function in proteins. Okay, so first off, proteins are the most abundant uh, organic macromolecule in living organisms. So if we compared it to carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids, proteins would be the most abundant. They make up um, the majority of the dry mass of all of your cells. They're also the most, they have the most diverse range and function, um, and they're, they also have uh, the greatest uh, diversity of molecules, okay? Um, proteins are made up of amino acids. So amino acids are going to be the monomers. Just like in sugars, we saw that, sorry, in carbohydrates, we saw that sugars or monosaccharides were the building blocks of carbohydrates. In this case of proteins, amino acids will be the building blocks of proteins. So they are the monomers that will be joined together to create the polymers that we call polypeptides or proteins. Um, here in this figure on this slide, this shows you the structure of an amino acid. And in lab this week, you are going to be building or drawing some simple amino acids and then um, putting uh, some simple amino acids together. And that's an activity four of the lab for this week. So this is the structure that all, there's 20 naturally occurring amino acids. We're gonna look at those in just a second, but all 20 of them share the same basic, what we call backbone structure. Okay, and this is the backbone here. So let's start on the left-hand side. This is an amino group. NH2 is an amino group. And that amino group is, uh, again, composed of a nitrogen covalently bonded to a hydrogen here and covalently bonded to a hydrogen here. And then that nitrogen will also be covalently bonded to this carbon. We call this carbon, it's in the middle. It's called the, the asymmetric or alpha carbon. It's going to be bonded to four different groups, an amino group, Okay, let's go all the way over here to the right. This is the carboxyl group. This is the second group that carbon is bonded to. Remember the carboxyl group or the Ku group? <clears throat> we have a carbon double bonded. So this is two pairs of electrons being shared to an oxygen and then single bonded to an O, an oxygen, and a hydrogen. Okay, so again, that's called a carboxyl group or it can also be called an acid group. Okay, um, and then this carbon is also bonded to something else. It could be a hydrogen, it could be a methyl group, it could be a whole lot of stuff, okay? And then that carbon is always gonna be bonded to a hydrogen. So this is the backbone for all 20 amino acids. The thing that's different between the 20 amino acids is what's, ooh, hold on, is what's here. Okay, and again, in a little bit, we're gonna be looking, again, back at this structure, and we're gonna be looking at the 20 different amino acids. <clears throat> and again, they're all gonna share the same basic structure. Amino group attached to a carbon, attached to a carboxyl group. And again, what's here, we call it the side chain or the R group. That's gonna be the difference between the 20 different amino acids, okay? So you can see how these are monomers. They share a basic structure. So what do proteins do? Again, we said that they have a multitude of different functions in your cells. Here's one potential function. Some proteins are enzymes. We're gonna do a whole lab on enzymes in just a couple of weeks. So you wanna make sure that you know the definition of an enzyme. An enzyme is going to be a substance that is going to speed up a chemical reaction. Um, biological enzymes, we call them catalysts. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> and that term catalyst, really catalyst, an enzyme can kind of be used interchangeably. Um, catalysts, again, are going to speed up or increase the reaction rate for a reaction. They're gonna make a reaction happen faster. Um, every enzyme is going to be specific 
for the reaction that it catalyzes. So we say that enzymes are specific for their substrate. The substrate is whatever the enzyme is going to act upon, bind to. Okay, um, some enzymes are going to speed up catabolic reactions, which are breakdown reactions. They're going to take substances and break them apart. And this enzyme that we have shown right here is a catabolic enzyme. And then some enzymes are anabolic enzymes. They'll take two molecules and they'll actually speed up the reaction, which puts those molecules together. Okay. Um, some examples of uh, some enzymes that you may have heard of, um, amylase, lipase, pepsin, trypsin. Those are all examples of enzymes. Um, the enzyme that we are going to work with in lab is called catalase. Um, and catalase, notice the ending. Let me draw this out for you. Catalase. Notice the ending, A-S-E, that tells you that it's an enzyme. Catalase is the catalyst. It gets kind of confusing the wording there that we're going to be working with in lab. Um, and catalase is an enzyme that speeds up the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. Um, so here is that reaction. It's better to get familiar with things sooner than later. Speeds up the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And I know this isn't balanced, but we'll balance it in a couple weeks when we get there. Okay, so that's the that's the reaction that you're going to be following in lab. Um, this is going to bother me, so let's just do. <laughs> okay, better. Um, so again, in 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 lab, um, you're going to be following this reaction, um, and you're going to be adding catalase uh, to uh, um, a mixture using an organism, um, and you're going to be actually watching this reaction happen. You're going to be testing you know, the effect of um, substrate concentration, so hydrogen peroxide, as well as um, uh, pH, I believe, on the rate of that reaction. Okay, so pretty neat. Just to let you know, um, that lab list of supplies that you need for lab this semester, there's three lab experiments that you're going to need supplies for. That is on your Blackboard lab site. Um, and you want to get those supplies as soon as possible, some of them, not all of them. Um, there's some things that you need fresh, but the hydrogen peroxide that you need for this lab, I would try to get it from now. You don't need it, I don't think, until week eight. Um, however, hydrogen peroxide is kind of a hot commodity right now, so I would make sure um, that I got that sooner than later. Okay, Okay, back to enzymes. So we're going to be studying the enzyme catalase in lab. Um, in this figure right here, this is pretty neat. This kind of is a good drawing for catalase. Um, so let's look here. So let's, oop, sorry. Start off here. So in purple, we have the enzyme. The green stuff there represents the substrate. Now in this example, it's a disaccharide. Those are, those are two sugar molecules joined together. Um, but we could even say, look, that's hydrogen peroxide, okay? Um, when the reaction proceeds, Okay, that whatever uh, that enzyme was working on, in this case, again, it was a disaccharide, the enzyme has, has sped up the breakdown, the hydrolysis of that disaccharide, and it releases the products here, the two simple sugars. Or in our case, it could have been water and oxygen. Okay, those molecules don't look like the shape of those, but um, it's still the same. So you've got an enzyme. The green stuff is the substrate. That's what the enzyme acts upon. Every enzyme is going to be specific to its substrate. So, for example, catalase. Catalase only works on hydrogen peroxide. It's not going to break down anything else. Um, um, lactase only breaks down lactose. Sucrase only bre breaks down sucrose. So, again, every enzyme is specific to what it catalyzes. And enzymes, um, most enzymes, are proteins. Okay, not all, but most enzymes are proteins. Okay, again, an, an enzyme is going to speed up the rate of a chemical reaction. So that's one potential function of a protein. They might be enzymatic. Some proteins are hormonal. Hormones are going to be chemical signaling molecules. They're going to regulate all kinds of stuff that happen in our bodies, like growth and development and metabolism. Okay, hormone proteins are involved in coordinating activities. And this figure right here that we have for you, um, we are talking about the hormone insulin. 
So right here, these little globular purple things, those are molecules of insulin. And you've all heard of insulin, right? Insulin is going to be a hormonal protein that gets released by the pancreas. And it's going to cause, it's going to, to trigger other tissues, other cells and tissues to take up glucose. Okay, and so what insulin does by doing that is it removes glucose from the bloodstream, helping to regulate normal glucose levels in the blood. Okay, so insulin is key to homeostasis. And insulin is a protein hormone. What else? So besides being enzymes and besides being hormones, some proteins are involved in transport. Um, proteins can transport substances from one part of the body to another, or other transport proteins might transport stuff into or out of your cells. In this particular example that we have here, this is a nice example because again, in the next coming chapters, chapters four and five, when we start to take a tour of the cell, we're going to look at the plasma membrane. And this particular picture here, look, there's that phospholipid bilayer that we just talked about. And sitting inside that phospholipid bilayer, is this thing right here, right? That purple globular thing, that's a protein. It's a transport protein. This particular one is called a channel protein. And what's it doing? It's moving the little blue spheres, whatever molecules those are, from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So it's transporting its cargo from one side of the membrane to the other. These transport proteins, just like enzymes, are gonna be really specific to what they transport. Um, another example, that we can just briefly talk about is, is hemoglobin. You've all heard of hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin um, is a protein. It's actually made up of four subunits, two alphas and two beta subunits. They make up this globular protein called hemoglobin. That's gonna be found in your red blood cells. And it also requires a heme group, an iron group to actually work properly. And what hemoglobin is going to do is it's going to pick up oxygen from the lungs and it's going to transport that oxygen to other areas of the body so it carries or transports oxygen from where it comes into the body to where it is needed in the body um, the shape of hemoglobin we're going to talk about that at the end of the in, in a little bit but the shape of hemoglobin is key to it grabbing onto and transporting oxygen if it's not shaped properly it can't bind to oxygen and therefore it can't move it. The same thing can be said of, let me back up to, of enzymes, for example. If this enzyme in the picture here is not shaped properly, then its substrate doesn't fit. It won't be able to bind to it. You've probably heard of lock and key, okay, or um, hand and glove, some people say as well. Um, proteins have to fold up and have the right three-dimensional shape in order to carry out their function. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. So where were we? We were here, we were talking about transport. Some proteins are involved in structural support. In lab next week, you are gonna be looking at animal tissues. And in that lab, you are going to see, you are going to see um, various types of cells and tissues um, but one of the tissues that you're going to look at under connective tissue is areolar connective tissue. Um, and you can really see the fibers um, inside of that particular tissue. The fibers that you're going to see um, are going to be collagen and elastin fibers, but here is collagen in, in this particular figure. So collagen is a protein, um, and in here you can see these string-like structures. Can you see those? Those are all collagen fibers. Um, collagen, again, is, is made up of protein. Um, and the collagen fibers, along with the elastin, elastin fibers found in this particular tissue, help it to provide structural support. OK, um, here's some more examples. Keratin is another structural support protein. We find keratin in our hair, in horns, feathers other skin appendages. Um, insects and spiders use silk fibers. Those are made of proteins to make cocoons and spider webs. 
okay? Um, so structural proteins, that's another fun potential function of proteins. So you can see already there's a wide variety of different roles that proteins play. Here's my favorite role, uh, defense proteins. So you've all heard of antibodies, right? You've probably all heard of antibodies more recently in the news. Um, if you've heard of the convalescent plasma that we're thinking about using as a potential treatment for COVID, um, there are antibodies. That, that's what that is. It's antibodies um, taken from people who have already been exposed to the virus. Um, so what are antibodies? They're proteins. They're proteins that protect um, us from foreign foreign pathogens, from bacteria, viruses, um, or parasites. Uh, antibodies will bind to viruses or bacteria and trigger the rest of your immune system to respond um, to destroy um, those invaders. Okay, so those are defense proteins. Contractile and motor proteins, we want to think of movement. So things inside of our bodies uh, that move or help us move muscle fibers, um, whether they're skeletal muscles or cardiac muscles or smooth muscles, um, muscle fibers have to move, right? Muscle cells have to move. They have to contract and expand. Controlling that movement of those cells are proteins, okay? The two proteins that come into play are actin and myosin. Um, they're called motor proteins. Uh, and again, they're responsible for movement. Okay, um, you may have also heard of cilia, hair-like structures covering the surface of some organisms or some cells, and flagella, the whip-like tail. Both of those structures also move by motor proteins. Okay, and when we get to chapter four, we'll talk a little bit more about those. Some proteins are involved in storage. So proteins are made of amino acids, and so this would be a store, a repository, of amino acids. Um, for example, let's look at the picture here. If you've ever cracked open an egg, inside of the egg um, would be a growing embryo if it was a fertilized egg. And what there would be inside of there as a nutritional source is something called ovalbumin. And ovalbumin is a storage um, site for amino acids. Okay, so those individual amino acids can be used by the growing embryo to construct other proteins. Um, you may have heard of, especially if you're a vegetarian, uh, the milk protein called casein. So casein is a protein found in milk, um, and this is a major source of amino acids for, for baby mammals, okay, that feed their young milk. So storage, storage of amino acids might be another function, okay? So there's our list of functions. Um, and again, there's a, a wide variety of different functions that, that proteins can have inside of living organisms. And so even within these different functions, there's many different types of proteins. Um, and remember that proteins are very specific to what they act upon or transport or, you know, whatever. They're very, very specific. Um, proteins are going to have different sizes, different molecular weights, different shapes. Remember that shape is critical to function, okay? Being folded up properly into a proper three-dimensional configuration tells us what the protein does. If the protein doesn't fold up properly, it will not be able to do its job. Environmental factors, the surroundings um, where that, where that uh, protein is acting in, are really, really important. And this is where homeostasis comes into play. If there is a change in temperature or pH, or if there is a change in chemicals in the area where the protein is doing its job, that protein might potentially change shape. And if it changes shape, it will not work right. We call a change in shape anytime a protein kind of unfolds um, from its proper three-dimensional configuration, we say that the protein has become denatured or we use the term denaturation. That means the unfolding of a protein. And that can happen if there's a temperature or a pH change. And in fact, in the lab, um, where you are going to study catalase, um, you are going to be uh, exposing uh, the enzyme. It's actually an organism that has the enzyme. You're going to be exposing that to um, different temperatures and also different substrate concentrations, but the substrate concentration won't change 
the shape of the protein. There's another lab that we're going to be doing dealing with cellular respiration where you're going to actually change pH as well. Um, so we're going to change different environmental factors actually in a couple of labs and see what happens. Um, and again, the enzymes really will be affected by any of these changes that you are going to be making. So proteins, it doesn't matter what kind we're talking about, they're all made from the same set of amino acids, and there's 20 different amino acids. You can kind of think of these like letters of the alphabet. They can be put together in different orders and in, in different lengths um, to give you, you know, a, um, a, a, a kind of unlimited amount of, of words, okay, or, or polypeptides, we'll call them. So again, just so that you know what they look like, this is kind of a simplified version of the of the first figure that I showed you. So we've got our amino group, we've got our carboxyl group, we've got our central carbon, and that carbon is going to be bonded to a hydrogen, and then what's here, right, the side chain or R group, is going to be different according to which amino acid we're looking at. Some amino acids are going to be hydrophobic. If the side chain here is nonpolar, if it's just carbon and hydrogen, it's going to be a hydrophobic amino acid. Sometimes this side group is polar, which makes it a hydrophilic amino acid. So we have hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids. Some side chains um, are considered to be acidic uh, if, they, if they have a carboxyl group, um, or they might be a basic side chain that will accept hydrogen um, ions. Okay, so the ch side chains are going to tell us how the amino acids are going to um, associate with each other within uh, the protein once the polypeptide is folded. So let's take a look at these different amino acids. And again, I do not expect you to memorize these, okay? I just want you to be aware that there are 20 different amino acids and that they have different properties, okay? So let's take a look at this first box here. So these are nonpolar um, amino acids that have a, an aliphatic um, side chain or R group, okay? And so the side chain or the R group is highlighted in blue. And so you'll see that these side chains are mostly made up of carbon and hydrogen. So they're pretty hydrophobic, nonpolar. The opposite is true down in this box. These are the polar but uncharged R group. So again, in blue, you'll see that there's no charge, but there's there's oxygens. Um, and therefore that makes them pretty polar, okay? Um, or sulfurs, okay? Um, the sulfhydryl group. The, this next one up here have actual charges or positively charged side chains. We have some that have negatively charged side chains, and then we have some that have ring structures as their side chain. So there's different categories or groups that we can place our amino acids into. I just want to quickly make note, you, you'll see the side chain of all these amino acids. So the amino group is actually a NH3 group and the N is a positive, and the carboxyl group is actually a COO negative. So what does that mean? So if I back up maybe one slide, the amino group uh, will actually accept a hydrogen to become positively charged. Okay, and the carboxyl group is actually going to um, donate that hydrogen and become negatively charged in aqueous environments. Okay, unless they're bonded together. Okay, so that's why on that particular figure they're shown as negative and positive uh, sides of that mo of the molecule. Okay, again, don't worry too much about the structure. I just want you to know that there's different types of amino acids and that they have different properties. Some are acidic, some are basic, some are positively charged, some are negatively charged. Um, okay, polar, nonpolar. Okay, in any event, those 20 different amino acids, right, they're going to combine chemically to form proteins. So again, the process by which a protein or a polypeptide is made is called dehydration synthesis, or again, you can call these condensation reactions. Um, if you have two amino acids that get put together, that's called a dipeptide. If you have three or more, it's called a polypeptide. It's a long chain of amino acids. 
okay? Um, what happens to put two amino acids together, and you're gonna demonstrate this in lab this week. Again, it's a dehydration synthesis reaction. Water is removed. A bond will be formed between um, the nitrogen of one amino acid's amino group and the carbon of the other amino acid's carboxyl group. Okay, so let's look at that, okay? Um, let's look at this simplified version over here first, okay? So here we have amino acid number one, and then we have amino acid number two, and these are both glycine. Um, and I know that because the R group is just hydrogen, it's the simplest amino acid, okay? So what's gonna happen? We wanna put these two together to form a dipeptide. So we're gonna remove water. So that's a hydroxyl group coming off of amino acid number one and a hydrogen coming off of amino acid number two. And we end up connecting this carbon and this nitrogen by a covalent bond here. And that bond gets a fancy name. This is called a peptide bond, okay? So in carbohydrates, the bond was called a glycosidic linkage. In fats, it was called an ester linkage. And in proteins, it's called a peptide bond. Okay, and this figure over here, what we have are two amino acids joined together already, and we're adding a third. And again, we're going to take out water, and we're going to create a, a peptide bond there in between. And that's it. That's how amino acids get put together to form uh, a polypeptide. Okay, so a protein, these are big. Proteins consist of one or more polypeptide chains that get put together. And those polypeptide chains usually have hundreds of amino acids all joined together in a very specific linear order. And just to let you know, the order of those amino acids is dictated by your DNA, okay? Your, your blueprint um, for proteins, okay? Your DNA, the sequence of your DNA codes for the sequence of amino acids in your proteins. Um, and that particular order of amino acids dictates how the protein folds and therefore how it functions. Okay. All right, I said this already. So again, there's 20 different amino acids. You can put them together like letters in the alphabet. Um, and you can get an almost infinite variety of protein molecules differing in number, types, and sequence of amino acids. Okay, so it's almost flu season. Uh, maybe it, we're approaching flu season. Um, so in this figure here, I'm showing you this lock and key, okay? Again, a protein has to take on uh, the right three-dimensional shape in order to work. So in this figure over here on the um, right is a flu protein. So this whole yellow and green structure, this is two polypeptide chains, one yellow, one green, that have um, become folded in a very specific way to take on a three-dimensional shape. And over here on the left, we got the same thing. We have an antibody protein that's been made by an, a person's body uh, that is specific to a, a structure on this flu protein. Okay, and you can see the regions here, uh, I should get a different color. The regions, let me get red, maybe. The regions here, yeah, which are kind of lit up, they look like. Those are uh, the spots that are going to fit together, okay? So your antibody protein would be your um, protein um, that is going to bind specifically to this flu protein in that specific spot, and then that's gonna trigger the rest of the immune system to mount an immune response, okay? If that antibody protein doesn't fold properly, or if the virus mutates, and therefore there's a different shape of this protein, uh, then your, your antibody will not recognize it. It will not be able to bind to it, okay? So shape tells you function. Being folded properly is going to allow whatever it is, an antibody or an enzyme, to bind to and to be able to do its job. Okay, so we've been talking about protein folding. How does that happen? There's four levels of protein structure, and 
when we get to the tertiary or quaternary shape, we've got a fully functional three-dimensional protein that's been folded. So the structure names are nice and easy. We've got primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, quaternary. So first, second, third, and fourth. Okay, these are the levels. So let's look at the primary structure first. So the primary structure of an amino acid is literally just the chain of amino acids that have been put together. Okay, so again, the primary structure of a protein is literally just the list of monomeric subunits, a list of amino acids. So in this particular um, picture, picture here, figure, this is the primary structure of this particular enzyme, transthyretin. Okay, I'm not sure what that enzyme does, but I guess it's an enzyme. Um, it is made up of this string of amino acids. So each one of these little spheres with the three letters in it is a different amino acid. So we've got glycine, proline, threonine, glycine, threonine, glycine, glutamine, serine, lysine, cysteine, proline, and so on and so forth. So you can see there's a big string of, in this case, there's 125 amino acids, okay, in the primary structure. Again, the sequence of these amino acids is coded for in your DNA. Okay, so that's the primary structure. It's just the sequence of the amino acids. Now we get some folding happening. So the secondary structure of a protein is going to result from some interactions, some hydrogen bonding among the backbone um, of the amino acids uh, in the protein. And so what we end up with are two specific structures. Uh, we will get alpha helices, these coils, and we will get beta pleated sheets, okay, which are kind of like folds. Okay, so that's the beginning of the folding of the protein, some helices and some folded pleated sheets. Again, that's due to associations, hydrogen bonding, and the backbone of the molecule. What happens next? Well, the rest of the polypeptide, the rest of that string of amino acids, gets folded up. So there's all kinds of other interactions that take place that give us this tertiary structure. Ionic bonding might happen, or maybe there's hydrophobic interactions, or maybe there's disulfide linkages. That's the attraction between sulfur or some more hydrogen bondings over here. So we end up with a three-dimensional shape for this polypeptide chain. That's the tertiary structure. Now, sometimes for some proteins, we end up with a quaternary or fourth level of structure. And that's when two polypeptide chains that have become folded, they associate with each other. So that's shown down here. It's two separate polypeptide chains now associating with each other, okay? So primary is the sequence of amino acids. Secondary is folding um, in the form of pleated sheets and alpha helices. Tertiary structure is more folding due to interactions now between the side chains, things like hydrogen bonding or hydrophobic interactions or sulfide bridges, all of those. And then quaternary structure would be the association of two polypeptide chains with each other. Okay, remember, folding, getting here, and folding up properly is key to the protein functioning properly. Okay, I've, I think I've said that a hundred times now. It's so important. So again, the overall structure of a protein is going to tell us what the protein does. Okay. Um, biological activity, uh, the activity of the protein can be disrupted if there is a change in the protein shape or if there's a change in the amino acid, oops, sorry, if there's a change, gotta go forward, in the amino acid sequence, that primary structure is so important. If the sequence of amino acids isn't right, well, then the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels are gonna be screwed up, okay? So if there is a mutation in the DNA that changes the amino acid sequence, that's going to create a problem. You've probably all heard of sickle cell anemia. Let's take a look at sickle cell anemia. So in sickle cell anemia, there is just one mutation in the DNA which causes there to not be the right shape of the protein. Uh, that's one of the protein, two of the pr protein subunits in hemoglobin. So before we look at that, let's take a look at hemoglobin. So again, we said that hemoglobin is a transport protein. We talked about that a couple slides ago. So here are some red blood cells. Oh, here 
are some red blood cells. If we were to pop open a red blood cell, they would be filled with hemoglobin. That's this. Hemoglobin is made up of four polypeptide chains, two alpha here, and two beta chains. Those chains get folded up, and then they associate with each other, and they also associate with iron. And that's going to allow them to carry oxygen. So these proteins have to take on a proper uh, um, quaternary shape, three-dimensional shape, and they have to also have iron, and then they can actually do their job. Okay, so what happens in people with sickle cell disease, sickle cell anemia? It's an inherited blood disorder, and people with sickle cell anemia, they their, their um, um, red blood cells do not carry uh, oxygen properly, um, and that's because of a single amino acid substitution in the protein beta hemoglobin. So those beta chains, there's a problem in the amino acid sequence, and therefore they don't fold properly. And it's actually just one amino acid. There's actually only one um, mistake, okay, caused by a mutation in the, in the genes uh, that gives this very terrible disease, okay? Um, that one substitution disrupts folding. So the secondary and tertiary structure of hemoglobin is not right in people with sickle cell anemia. So let's look at this. This is pretty neat. So at the top, we've got the normal primary structure for this protein. We've got the normal secondary structure, the normal quaternary structure, and then your red blood cells have this nice concave shape. In people with sickle cell disease, that's at the bottom. If you look at position six of the primary structure, instead of having glutamine, people who have sickle cell disease have valine in its place. And that's a huge problem. It's a single substitution. Let's look at the structure of the protein. Look at the tertiary structure here. It does not look like that. Look at the quaternary structure. It does not look like that. So instead of these hemoglobin molecules being separated from each other and each carrying their own oxygen, what happens in people with sickle cell disease is these hemoglobin molecules end up kind of attaching to each other. They're kind of sticky. And you end up with hemoglobin fibers that crystallize inside of red blood cells instead of individual hemoglobin molecules. So the red blood cells of people with sickle cell disease are not nice and concave. Instead, they are crescent shaped and they are locked into that position. And so not only is there a lack of oxygen, but these red blood cells also have a real difficult time traveling in small blood vessels like capillaries. They tend to get stuck. And so blood clotting is a huge issue for people with sickle cell disease. Okay. Um, there's actually been some preliminary uh, genetic studies uh, done with people with sickle cell disease in the United States where we've used CRISPR technology. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that. It's pretty much gene editing where we've gone in and we've been able to actually change, um, uh, change the, the gene, the sickle cell uh, disease gene, back to the normal form and the person's body will start to make normal red blood cells again, normal hemoglobin again, and their red blood cells take on that normal shape. So the treatment for sickle cell disease um, is not completely here yet, but um, scientists are definitely working on it and it looks pretty promising. Okay, so again, one change in the primary structure leads to a faulty tertiary and quaternary structure, which means the protein can't do its job. It can't transport oxygen. Okay, form equals function. Okay, so just again, um, if you were to take a protein, I know I mentioned this, and, and heat it up or, or subject it to alterations in pH or treat it with certain chemicals, that protein again would unfold. And if the protein unfolds, it doesn't work. Okay, there are special uh, molecules, they're actually proteins themselves, 
inside of your cells that are there to make sure your proteins fold appropriately. These are pretty neat. Um, they're called molecular chaperones. These are proteins that are going to help other proteins fold properly. Okay, um, they'll actually create separate environments in which that protein can fold in. So pretty cool. You can see how important the three-dimensional shape of a protein is um, to its function. Your cell actually, you know, creates a whole class of proteins devoted to helping other proteins fold. Pretty cool. Okay, so this has been kind of a long talk here. Let me give you a break. And I want you to go ahead and answer some of these questions. Okay, so you want to make sure you've got your are you with me's out. And you can go ahead and you can answer those questions. I can't find my pointer here. <laughs> when you're finished, come on back. Okay, so um, let's just do these couple of questions. The monomers that make up proteins are called, are they nucleotides, disaccharides, amino acids, or chaperones? So what are the monomers of proteins? Hopefully you answered amino acids in green. Second one, the alpha helix and beta pleated sheets are part of which protein structure? Primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary? And hopefully you answered secondary. Okay, next question. Mad cow disease is an infectious disease where one misfolded protein causes other copies of the protein to begin misfolding. This is an example of a disease impacting which structure? Primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary? So for this question, it could be either tertiary or quaternary, right? It depends if the protein, most proteins associate with other, pro, other most proteins are made up of two or more polypeptide chains. Uh, but there are some that are just single. So it would be tertiary or quaternary would be acceptable for that answer. Okay. Last section here, we're going to talk about nucleic acids. We're going to talk about um, the structure and the two types of nucleic acids. Um, and we'll look at DNA and RNA. Those are, those are the two nucleic acids. Okay, so first off, let's define nucleic acids. These are macromolecules, organic biological macromolecules, that are responsible for transmitting hereditary information um, and determining which proteins the cell makes. There's two types of nucleic acids. We've got DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, and we have RNA, which is ribonucleic acid. And they, they look a little different and they have different jobs. So DNA is gonna be what's, if we're a eukaryotic cell like ours, what's enclosed in the nucleus. Um, it's going to be the, the molecule of heredity, the genetic blueprint um, of the cell. It contains genes. All of the instructions for making proteins are located in your DNA. RNA is kind of like the middleman. RNA is a single stranded copy of DNA in which proteins are made from. They're the link um, between DNA and proteins. And um, they're gonna be the instructions for the primary amino acid sequence of polypeptides. Okay, so wanted to give you kind of a, a, a visual of this. So if this is a eukaryotic cell, like our cells, um, here's the cytoplasm out here. I don't have the plasma membrane on here. We don't really need it for this one. But this purple sphere thing in the middle, this is the nucleus, okay? And we're looking inside the nucleus, and we see our molecule of heredity, which is DNA. It's a double-stranded helical structure. It's going to stay in the nucleus, except for during cell division. And it's your blueprint. Proteins are made out here in the cytoplasm. So proteins are not made directly from DNA. Instead, we've got kind of the middleman molecule. A copy of the gene is going to be made in the form of what we call RNA. One form of that RNA is called mRNA. We won't worry about the forms too much yet. That is going to get transported out or exported out of the nucleus. It goes into the cytoplasm and it's going to be read by a protein, um, protein and it's also made of RNA, a, a structure called the ribosome. 
okay? So the ribosome is made out of protein and R RNA, ribosomal RNA. That's the second type. The M here stands for messenger, okay? And with the help of tRNA, transfer RNA, the ribosome is going to read the mRNA and it's going to put amino acids, link them together covalently, right through dehydration synthesis, and eventually we'll end up with a polypeptide, which will fold into a protein. Okay, so DNA, and then our RNA, we've actually got three types. We've got mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA. They're all going to play a, a role in protein synthesis. Okay. Okay. Let's put this up here. So again, both DNA and RNA are going to be polymers, just like we saw with carbohydrates and with proteins. The monomers, the subunits, for both DNA and RNA are called nucleotides. And each nucleotide has three parts. The first part is a sugar. The second part is a phosphate group. And the third part, part <laughs> is a nitrogenous base. Okay, let me give you more details now. So the sugar, if we are in DNA, that sugar is going to be deoxyribose. If we are talking about RNA, that sugar is ribose. Okay? And the difference here um, between deoxyribose and ribose is actually pretty subtle. If you look at carbon, this carbon right here, carbon number two here, there's an OH group on ribose, and on deoxyribose, it's just a hydrogen. Okay, that's the only difference. So in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose, and in RNA, the sugar is ribose. The second component is a phosphate group. That's right here. So here's the sugar, here's the phosphate. And the third thing is the base. Okay, now there are five bases. There's four in each type of, um, of, of nucleotide, okay? Um, so in DNA, we have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, or A, T, C, and G. In RNA, we have adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. So the difference there, DNA has thymine, where RNA has uracil. Those nitrogenous bases are up here for you. They're called nitrogenous because they all contain nitrogen. I don't need you to worry about structure. If you take general biology two with me, we're gonna look real deep at these. Um, we will look at structure. But for now, I just need you to know the types, okay? So let's review. So a nucleotide is made up of a phosphate covalently bonded to a sugar, which is bonded to a nitrogenous base. In DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. In RNA, the sugar is ribose. And for the nitrogenous bases, DNA has A, T, C, and G, and RNA has uracil in place of T, in place of thymine. Okay? Okay, so let's look at DNA in a little bit more detail. So DNA, shown here, okay? Or if we want to look at the actual structure, the, the actual molecules there, we can... We can actually unwind it and just kind of look at it, um, not unzipped, but unwound at least, okay? So DNA is gonna be double-stranded. So that means it's composed of a strand. If we, we can kind of cut it down the middle on the dotted line, this would be strand one, and this would be strand two. Um, DNA is the carrier of genetic information. So your genes lie in your DNA. Your DNA stays in the nucleus if it's a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotes, their DNA stays in a, in a region called the nucleoid, but it's not membrane bound. And again, the sugar is deoxyribose, and the nitrogenous bases are A, T, uh, C, and G. Um, purines and pyrimidines, I don't know if I mentioned that in the previous slide. Um, the purines are the large bases. Those are A and G and the pyrimidines are the single-ringed bases. They're smaller, 
and those are going to be C, T, and U. In DNA, we only have C and T. Okay, so let's take a little look. Um, we'll look at strand one. We got a phosphate group followed by our sugar, deoxyribose, which is then bonded to our base, thymine. So there's one nucleotide. Here's the next nucleotide, phosphate, sugar, base. And in this case, the base is guanine. Okay, so you can see it's a repeating unit of nucleotides. If I go to my second strand, I find the same thing. I've got my base, adenine, adenine in this case, my sugar, and my phosphate. There's a nucleotide. The next nucleotide is right here. Base, sugar, phosphate. So it's a repeating unit. It's a polymer of those monomeric subunits. Okay. RNA, it's kind of like DNA, except for there's some really key differences. So again, RNA is going to be single-stranded. DNA was double. RNA is involved in protein synthesis. It does not carry genes. It's not the molecule of heredity. It's just a copy of those genes. RNA can leave the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell. It can go to the cytoplasm. The sugar is ribose instead of deoxyribose. And here the bases are going to be Cu, A, and G. So uracil replaces thymine. Okay. And in this figure, what we have here is this stretch down here, this is the mRNA, okay? It's a sequence of bases, a single-stranded sequence. The ribosome is being shown here and here. There's actually two subunits, a large and small. The ribosome is going to be a protein that actually has some rRNA in it as well that is going to read the sequence of bases. And then the tRNA molecules are actually the the, the, the structures that will bring in amino acids. So all of these little spheres that you see, those are amino acids all getting linked together. So that's the growing polypeptide chain. So literally the ribosome, with the help of rRNA and tRNA, reads the mRNA, reads the, the copy of the gene, and by reading it, it's going to put the amino acids in the specific order coded for by your DNA. So the sequence of amino acids in your proteins is dictated by the sequence of nucleotides in your DNA. Okay, so that's it. So what I want you to do is finish up these last questions and then come back and we'll go through a couple of questions together. Okay, so welcome back. Here's a couple of questions for you. So the first one, a nucleotide of DNA may contain, so DNA, red is going to be ribose, uracil, and a phosphate group, blue, deoxyribose, uracil, and a phosphate group, green, deoxyribose, thymine, and a phosphate group, or yellow, ribose, thymine, and a phosphate group. So think about that for a second. And hopefully you said green, right? So DNA has deoxyribose, it has thymine, not uracil. Uracil is found in RNA. And both DNA and RNA have that phosphate group. Okay, so that's a nucleotide. Sugar phosphate base. Um, next question. The building blocks of nucleic acids are sugars, nitrogenous bases, peptides, or nucleotides. So hopefully you said nucleotides, right? Nucleotides are going to be those monomers made up of sugar, phosphate, and base. That's it. Ooh. So we've finished chapter three. Um, you should be finished with the Are You With Me's for chapter three. You can go ahead and upload those to Blackboard. And then you want to study a little bit to get ready for the chapter three quiz. Okay. Once that's finished, then you're done with chapter three. The next thing that you want to start doing is studying chapters one, two, and three for your first test, which is going to open up pretty soon. Okay, so you want to go ahead and make sure that you're ready for that.